Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Aeschylus's play, The Suppliants, or The Suppliant Women. Um, this is probably my favorite play from ancient Greek tragedy, because there's a lot of really fascinating, complicated stuff going on here. Um, and I'm going to focus on two of the elements that are that are interesting and complicated. Um, and if I'm if I'm totally honest right now at the beginning, this is not my favorite translation of the play. Uh, this is a translation by Janet Lemke. Uh, sorry, Janet, if you ever watch this video, which you probably won't, um, but you know, this is not my favorite translation of the play. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of the reasons for that. Um, but the two things that I'm going to talk about that I think are really, really interesting and complicated in this play are the depiction of democracy and the role of, or the attitude toward foreigners. So essentially what happens in the suppliants is that a group of 50 women called the Danaids, named after their father Danos, uh, flee Egypt to avoid enforced marriage to their cousins, the sons of Egyptos, um, and they, the Danaids sail to Argos in Greece, which is where their ancestor Io came from. Um, when they arrive, they enter a sacred grove, and they basically become suppliants under the protection of the gods. They, uh, they beg King Pelasgos for sanctuary in the city of Argos, for the city itself to actually protect them from... Uh, being sort of kidnapped and taken back to Egypt for these enforced marriages. Uh, Pelasgos says, I'm on your side, but I can't actually offer you sanctuary until the Argive Council votes on it. So the Argive Council does. They hold a democratic vote, um, at which point uh, they unanimously decide to support the suppliants, and... Uh, Pelasgos comes back just in time to find some Egyptian sailors with a, a herald, a messenger on behalf of uh, the sons of Egyptos, trying to kidnap the women out of the grove. Pelasgos and his, his entourage basically drive off the sailors, and then they, uh, the women stay in Argos. Now, this was the first play of a three-series trilogy. Um, and while the, the second and third plays are lost, we know the general plot line. Um, but The Suppliants is a really interesting play because it gives us one of our most detailed discussions of democracy in an, in an ancient Greek city-state. And actually, one of the things that's interesting is that... Um, this play has the earliest the earliest version of the word that would become democracy. Um, and this this is actually one of the things I don't like about this translation, because when uh, Pelasgos and uh, Danos have gone off to the Argive Council to try and convince them to, to protect the women, uh, Danos then comes back to report the news and the one of the suppliants says uh, elder statesman you bring the news most hoped for tell me tell me what decision has been made where did the hands of the majority show winning strength and so actually we've got a number of different references throughout the play to that idea of the hands or voting by hands which was uh, one of the ways that that people voted in ancient Athens, citizens voted in ancient Athens, was by raising right hands. Um, in other translations of this that I've read, uh, you get a much closer sense, because I think in the Greek, and I don't read Greek, so this is based on what other scholars have said, um, in the Greek there is something there is a line that might be more accurately translated as something like 
tell us how the power of the people has worked. And, of course, in, in Greek you get the words demos for people and kratos for power, uh, which is democracy, democracy. Um, so, in the original Greek, I think, uh, based on what other scholars have said who actually do read Greek, you have a version of the word that's going to become democracy at some point. Not necessarily by, uh, I think this is the 560s, uh, low 560s when, when this play is, is uh, first presented. Um, but you have that description of, the, of democracy in action. The raising of hands, the taking of votes, um, and da, da, da. so we get this actually more directly. Um, Pelasgos, when he first shows up and he's sort of trying to figure out who the, the suppliants are and what they want, um, he tells them, But you do not sit as claimants to the safety of my private hearth. It is the body politic, the people, that must be contaminated in concert. Uh, in concert, they who must then cure their houses and the, their lives of blood ghosts. And I, one man, can offer you no contract until the citizens, all of them, publicly debate your case. And then later he says, I have told you, tell you now, not without the polity's consent, may I act on the question, not even though I rule, lest in time... Uh, in time to come, if anything in any way untoward should happen, the householders convict me. Aliens, you honored them, you damned your people. So, Pelascos repeatedly tells the suppliants, it needs to be discussed in the Argive Council. I can't make this decision myself. And it's clear that the Arg that it's clear that the Danaids, the suppliants, don't necessarily understand this perspective at the beginning, because one of the things uh, that we that they say, you the people, you the government, a pharaoh chosen unimpeachable, you sustain the fire blazing on your country's altar hearth, with single voice decrees your own and single handed from your sovereign bench, bring all debts to final reckoning, beware heaven's curse. So, I mean, the Danaids are coming from Egypt, which in Aeschylus's imaginary, whether he was ever there or not, I have no idea. Um, I've never seen any suggestion that he was in Egypt, but uh, there was a lot of travel throughout the Eastern Mediterranean in the 5th century uh, BCE, as well as before. So it's entirely possible. I have no idea. Um, but in Aeschylus's imaginary here, Egypt is this kind of totalitarian state where the pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, rules unquestioned. Um, and, and one of the things that's interesting about that is that actually, earlier in the play, Pelascos does kind of give the sense that um, he, is a, he is an authoritarian ruler. So in one of his first speeches to the, the suppliants, he says, uh, I rule the... And this, I'm just reading tiny excerpts here. It's a 30-some it's a line speech. But he says, I rule this realm... And then he twice says the phrase, I hold all power. So he's introducing himself as the king here, the person that they need to deal with in order to get what they want. And he is presenting himself as someone with the authority to make these unilateral decisions that he then later says, oh, I need to talk to the council. I can't, I can't do it myself. So that's a very interesting transition we have here. The other thing that's, in, that's worth noting about the play's depiction of democracy is that this is supposed to be sort of mythic age Argos. This is not 5th century Argos. This is maybe 8th century or something like this. Not a very... I mean, it's the around the generalized time when things like 
the Trojan War is going on, or when things like uh, Oedipus is ruling Thebes and whatever. This sort of mythical past. Argos would not have been democratic. So this is clearly not an accurate represent, not an accurate historical representation of, say, eighth century BCE Argos, but this is something that Aeschylus's fifth century BCE Athenian audience would recognize. And so, one of the arguments that scholars have made, and I think this is right, I subscribe to this argument, is the idea that playwrights and the Aristocrats who, who financially supported the performances of plays had a vested interest in pro-democratic messages, at least from what we have surviving. Um, and so I think that's what we're getting here, is this sort of vested interest in pro-democracy being sort of modeled and taught and, and valued through theory. So that's democracy in the sublines, a, a, a basic overview. The other thing that I think is interesting, the second thing, is the way that non-Greeks are discussed. Um, because Pelasgos initially, when he shows up, the first thing he says to the women is, where have you come from? A congregation glittering, bizarre and alien robes and diadems and womanly, yet gaudy as no woman I have ever known or dreamed. And how have you come here without forewarning or invitation? Helped and guided only by a reckless courage, I am amazed. But the branches that lie beside you in God's shadow seem law-horned signs that you claim asylum. At this point, at this one point, perhaps your world meets mine. So very clearly, right from the first speech, this is, he's dealing with people who look foreign, uh, who are dressed in a foreign style, etc., etc. He, he clearly does not identify them as Greeks. They make a claim to being Greek. And again, they are the, the, the Danaids, actually, as well as the sons of Egyptos, are descendants of Io, who was a Greek, uh, and in the myth, uh, she is turned into a cow because uh, Hera is jealous of Zeus's sexual desire for her. So Hera uh, basically, I think, turns her into a cow, and then she's attacked by a stinging fly, and she basically goes from Greece around the eastern Mediterranean down to Egypt. Um, and then she becomes the mother of uh, either the mother or the, the grandmother of Danos and Egyptos. Um, but Pelasgos, again, sort of re-emphasizes this, this impression of them as foreigners uh, a little bit later when he says, Strangers spin me incredible tales. How can Argive soil and air be yours by birth? Women seated in the fields of Libya, surely you resemble them rather than our native daughters. And Nile might nurture such luxuriance. Luxuriance. And Cypriot craftsmen do stamp male conceits of female forms like yours on copper blanks. And like you, the nomads I hear of, sunburnished women who saddle their humpbacked horses, the camels, and ride Ethiopia's borders, and the husbandless, flesh-feeding, feasting Amazons. If you bore weapons, certainly you would be they. But tell me more, perhaps I may more may then understand how birth and heritage make Argos yours. So basically he says, you don't look anything like the women of Argos. You look like Egyptians or uh, Libyans or Cypriots or uh, Ethiopians. So there is this like clearer sense of a border between Greek and non-Greek, but when they tell the story of their descent from Io, he actually accepts them as fellow Greeks. He accepts them as uh, people that Argos has an ethical responsibility to protect, and that's part of the reason he goes to um, the Argive Council and tries to persuade them to support the suppliant's claims. 
Now, what's really interesting to me about this is that when the Egyptians show up at the end, and again, these are the sons of Egyptos, they are also descendants of Io, and therefore they are as Greek as the Danaids. Um, when the Egyptians show up at the end, Pelasgos is incredibly rude to them and quite xenophobic in some ways. And this translation actually is, is a pretty mild one, but I've read other translations that are much more insulting. Um, but he, he Pelasgos addressing the, um, the spokesman of the Egyptians, the herald of the Egyptians, says, Savage, you insult Greeks far too carelessly. Um, and then he, he, he makes a couple of references to strangers should behave decently. So it's an interesting sort of double standard where the women are offered protection and they're actually even offered housing at public expense um, because they are descendants from the Greeks, whereas Egypto, the sons of Egyptos are rejected xenophobically and, and sort of insulted and driven out of Argos, um, even though they are at least as Greek as the Danaids.